ladies and gentlemen, trigger alert. We're covering Five Nights at Freddy's sister location. On with the show! Five nights at, oh, I can't even make the same joke. I've made so many of these. Five nights at Freddy's, sister location, or as I like to call it, five nights at Freddy's five. That's right, FNAF five, 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 FNAF five, five, five. Some of you love the games and requested it. There's a group that hates it and think FNAF has been played out. Then there are people like me who's just kind of numb to it at this point. This semi-spin-off pseudo-sequel was first teased in April 2016. The only word shown was Sister Location. This gave a lot of people hope, myself included, that this might be something different. I've been a fan of indie game developer Scott Cawthon for a few years now. I think he has a great mind for storytelling and promotion, so when I first saw this, I thought, nice, finally Scott's gonna move on to another horror title. Maybe something different in nature, having little or nothing to do with the FNAF lore. You know, have an all new, nope, nope. Don't get me wrong, I understood the title, Sister Location, but that's what made me feel like this was going to be way different. I felt like, yeah, sure, there might be a reference or two about an animatronic attack elsewhere, or mention of the Bite of 87, or even maybe somebody say the name Freddy in passing, but no! Freddy is in this game! And of course he is! Why wouldn't he be? If I'm going to give this game any kind of credit, I will say it's cool that you can finally move your character. And no, Five Nights at Freddy's 4 doesn't count because you're just running to door 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 to bed. Perhaps it would be best before I get too worked up if we just start from the beginning. The last game, not counting FNAF World, was Five Nights at Freddy's 4, the quote unquote final chapter. But in all fairness, like I said last season, the final chapter suffix had been dropped by the game's release and wasn't featured on the title screen. Not only that, but I can't help but feel like it was a reference to Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter. And if you're a horror fan, you know damn well that wasn't the final chapter. Besides, I can't say anything about titles. I changed names on my last Halloween episode quite a bit. Go see for yourself. No, really. Go. See it. Look at it. Watch it! So many gamers, like myself, thought, Okay, wow, Scott's done with the series for a bit and will go on to create some new intellectual properties. And maybe one day return to FNAF. You know, because lockbox and all. And you know what? He did. Sorta. With FNAF World. Sure, it was the same characters, but it was presented in a totally different light. The game is an RPG, it's supposed to be non-canon, which we'll touch on later, and this title had more of a light-hearted tone. Okay, so maybe now that Scott has slowly transitioned out of the FNAF formula, he might try his hand at a different kind of horror game. I mean, that's what the whole thank you screen was all about, right? A fitting end to FNAF for the time being? Maybe Scott will go back to his roots and make some sort of interesting side-scroller. Maybe a new RPG. Possibly even an original new horror game. Or maybe- nope. So here we are again. But to be fair, just like all the other FNAF titles, Scott Cawthon always adds a few more bells and whistles to make each game just different enough. I can't say Sister Location isn't the same formula, because it's not. But when you get down to the bare essentials, when you get down to the game's endoskeleton, you're still a guy 
who is trying not to get killed by a bunch of creepy animatronics. Period. It's not confirmed, but the general consensus is that we play as William Bill Afton. If you've read the book Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes, then you'll know Afton as... Spoilers! The purple guy himself. Not only that, but Afton tends to be a key character in other ways as well. If he is the purple guy, then that means he's Springtrap from FNAF 3, which ironically was supposed to be the end of the series originally. If he is the purple guy, then that means he was the one behind the missing children. He was also seen in an Easter egg from FNAF 4. Not only that, but the book reveals him as one of the business managers of Fred Bear Pizza, along with another gentleman named Henry. So the game starts in a very ominous tone with this strange dialogue. There's no doubting what you've achieved on a technical level. These are clearly state-of-the-art. There are just certain design choices that were made for these robots that we don't fully understand. We were hoping that you could shed some light on those. She can dance. She can sing. She's equipped with a built-in helium tank for inflating balloons right at her fingertips. She can take song requests. She can even dispense ice cream. With all due respect, those aren't the design choices we were curious about, Mr. Afton. The second voice, as you heard, was confirmed as William Afton. So we assume we play as Afton in Sister Location, but why would he want to take this job? A question that actually gets brought up later in the game. The main difference with Sister Location compared to other installments besides walking or crawling, is that each night you have a different task. That, and this title has a lot more expository dialogue compared to the others. For example, we typically have some sort of phone guy explain just a few things to us. Hell, in FNAF 4, we didn't even have that. But in Sister Location, nobody shuts up! It's funny! The few playthroughs I've actually watched, gamers have had a hard time talking without getting interrupted or talked over. There is always some animatronic chiming in, flapping its gums, giving its two cents worth. Pretty funny. I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but Night One is like Night One from the other games. Much like the patterns of creepy gaming, the Five Nights at Freddy series has its own formula too. In the FNAF games, there is little to no threat on night one. The first shift is just basically there to set the stage. Your setting is established, as per usual there is offbeat humor, and you are given your main objective. Here is a small example of what I'm talking about. Welcome to the first day of your exciting new career. Whether you were approached at a job fair, read our ad in screws, bolts, and hairpins, or if this is the result of a dare, we welcome you. I will be your personal guide to help you get started. I'm a Model 5 of the Handyman's Robotics and Unit Repair System, but you can call me Hand Unit. Your new career promises challenge, intrigue, and endless janitorial opportunities. Please enter your name as seen above the keypad. This cannot be changed later. It seems that you had some trouble with the keypad. I see what you were trying to type, and I will auto-correct it for you. One moment. Welcome, Eggs Benedict. Boom! There you have it. You might not know everything yet, but you know just enough. Like I've said, night one is easy. You learn to check through the windows to make sure the animatronics are on stage. When they're not, you give them a shock, which I'm sure they just love. Night two is when the creepiness really picks up. While doing your typical routine, the synthetic voice instructor begins to malfunction. Before you know it, the grid's locked up and the system needs to be rebooted. The feeling you get when the system temporarily shuts down is absolutely nerve-wracking. During this time, we hear a foreboding message from who we believe to be Circus Baby. I don't recognize you. You are new. I remember this 
scenario, however. It's a strange thing to want to do, to come here. I'm curious what events would lead a person to want to spend their nights in a place like this. Willingly. Maybe curiosity? Maybe ignorance. There is a space under the desk. Someone before you crafted it into a hiding place, and it worked for him. I recommend that you hurry, though. You will be safe there. Just try not to make eye contact. It will be over soon. They will lose interest. So as you heard, you must hide from these creepy little kid animatronics. We saw these teased a while back. So, wait a minute. The series started with animatronics possessed by children. Now we have actual kid animatronics? <laughs> wow. Now if we can just get one of the animals to possess one of the animatronic children, then we can say that we've come full circle. Anyway, I digress. So as you hide, you'll hear the children taunt and tease you. They try to pry open the door, but once you figure out how to click and hold the door, then it's pretty easy. Still creepy though. When the system comes back online, you must manually switch the breakers, but in order to get there, you must first get through the Laura Gallery. If you haven't played the game yet and still want to, then be forewarned. I am going to cover some minor spoilers. Ballora is one of the newer animatronics, human in nature and nearly seven feet tall. To get past her, you must walk slowly and stop when you hear her music playing nearby. One of the creepiest parts of the game, to me anyway, is when you get to the end of the corridor and see Ballora's tall silhouette spinning in front of you. It's always nice actually seeing the animatronics move. Reminds me of the slow, creepy Freddy limping around from FNAF 3. Once in the breaker room, you must quickly restore power to the facility while trying not to be mutilated by Funtime Freddy. Doesn't sound like a fun time to me. You have to flip back and forth from keeping Freddy at bay and restoring power on your tablet, which is a nice callback to the older games. Oh, and believe it or not, we finally hear what Freddy Fazbear sounds like. Okay, so not exactly what I was expecting. I don't know, I was thinking he had more of a Barney-like voice, like, Hey kids, don't you want some pizza? Ah, oh, never mind. Ah! No wonder kids are so terrified by Freddy. And speaking of, on night three, you get up close and personal with the man, er, bear himself. You must disconnect Funtime Freddy's power module. Sounds simple enough, right? Okay, not really. But before you can even do that, you must first get through the Funtime Gallery. Since Ballora was built with audio detection, then Funtime Foxy must be built with visual detection. Naturally. Because game, that's why. Using a sensor beacon, you must get past Funtime Foxy which we find out is the original Mangle. We'll discuss this in the Easter egg section. I just had to mention it since Mangle is probably my favorite character of the series. Roll the footage! The difficulty definitely gets kicked up a notch here. Once you make it out of the Funtime Gallery, you must remove the power modules off of Freddy and the Bonnie Puppet. Bonbon bon can be a little tricky, so to hit the switch, shine your flashlight away just long enough for the puppet to pop up. Exit through the fun time gallery once again and you unexpectedly begin night four. Now like I said earlier, these games get repetitive and for a spin-off, I was expecting different gameplay, but I will give credit where credit is due. Rather than catching up with soap operas, Night 4 is different, creative, and challenging as hell. You awake in a Springtrap suit. Okay, so not 
the spring trap suit, but apparently a similar model. The female voice that we assume to be Circus Baby becomes a lot more passive aggressive towards you. At first she seems like she's helping you through the game, but it's not until night four you realize everything might not be as it seems. You'll hear two technicians talking before sending in a broken Ballora. Being stuck in this spring suit, you must balance wiggling and resetting the spring locks for three of the longest minutes of your life. I have heard that this night has since been patched, so it might not be as difficult as it originally was. Basically, to survive the night, you have to wait for Ballora's little friends, the mini Renas, to climb up your suit as high as they can before you wiggle. Every time you do wiggle, you loosen the spring locks. So you see the paradox here. If not done correctly, either your suit will snap shut or you will get killed by one of these creepy little bastards. Many may notice the similarities between the mini arenas and a series favorite, the puppet. Or marionette, just depends on what you want to call them. Night 5 is when you really begin to notice the game's patterns. This night is very similar to night three where you must once again get past the Funtime Gallery and work on Baby, much like you had to do with Funtime Freddy earlier. This, ironically, is the first and last time you see Circus Baby in the entire game. Not counting the mini games, of course. It's really ironic considering she is supposed to be the main focus of the game. Most of the teaser images feature her, and the game is called Sister Location after all. I give a lot of the credit to voice actress Heather Masters. She brought the character of Circus Baby to life. Her great line delivery helped carry the game, and you wouldn't expect this to be the only time where you actually see her. Well done. One extremely disturbing moment from Night 5 is when you first return back to work. You're back at the job, you go check on the animatronics, but when you turn on the lights, you'll see the silhouettes of who we believe to be the two technicians from the night before. I'll leave off with Night 5 right here because I've already spoiled a lot, but there are still people who haven't played it. I hope this video helps explain a little and helps you get through some of the tougher areas. In the next edition, I'll pick up right where I left off and cover spoilers, easter eggs, and theories. I've already talked about the backstory and lore earlier, but before I go, I would like to briefly talk about what is canon and what is not, supposedly. According to Scott Cawthon, FNAF 1 through 4 are canon. FNAF World is its own meta-universe, the book Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes is supposed to be its own special timeline. We assume Sister Location fits in with the Afton timeline from Silver Eyes, but as many of you know, Scott's outlook on canon can be pretty loose sometimes. We will discuss this more in the next edition. I am producing these episodes separately rather than splitting one production into two videos. So basically, I can focus and find the newest easter eggs and theories, which are literally popping up every day. This episode was meant to focus on the game itself, the backstory of how it came about, and its timeline. Overall, while I did enjoy the game for the most part, I guess I felt it wasn't as different as a lot of people made it out to be. Sure, nights 2 through 4 had their own unique events, but I guess it just felt like a bunch of mini games in the same FNAF formula, just made to look different. It's not my favorite of the series, but if you're a fan and you followed this far, then you're going to want to check this one out too. I will go as far to say that the best addition of this game is the voice acting. Thanks to the great writing and excellent cast, it has just made the game that much creepier and gives us a lot more to discuss. Guess that's gonna do it for me, folks. I wanna thank you all so much for watching. Hi, I'm Mullet Mike with a on full screen arcade. Thank you. Stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace.